Thank you for joining us in a new year of community conservation, a series that presents projects, ideas, and people surrounding conservation in Oregon. I'm your host, Sarah Armstrong, the marketing manager at Oregon Wildlife Foundation. And for those of you who are new with the foundation, we're an organization that's dedicated to funding wildlife and habitat conservation work throughout Oregon since 1981. If you want to support the foundation, please make a donation in the box below at any time. If you have questions for our speakers, simply type your message in the chat and they'll get to it. We also have volunteer information and contact info for our speakers that we'll um, give you at the end of our discussion. Today, we're taking a cold, wet, and sometimes fatal journey with our friends, the Northern Red-Legged Frog, as well as looking at how we can understand the paths our wildlife take instinctually throughout their lifetime. I have two experts with me today who specialize in safely connecting wildlife with their natural habitat. Welcome to the series, Rachel Wheat, Wildlife Connectivity Coordinator at the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Jane Hartline, the Volunteer Coordinator at the Harperton Fox Shuttle. Welcome. Rachel, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your expertise? Yeah, sure. So um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm the Wildlife Connectivity Coordinator for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I work at a statewide level to help identify and enhance wildlife connectivity. So we're looking at where animals move on the landscape, where they might be impeded by different barriers and how we can work to either conserve or restore or enhance those habitats to ensure that wildlife can move where they need to on a daily and seasonal basis. Great, and Jane, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Sure, uh, I'm Jane Hartline. I'm the, um, I'm one of the uh, people who's been on the Harborton Frog Shovel from the beginning when it was just a few of us and now it's a hundred something volunteers. And um, I'm also the director of the Soviet Island Habitat Partnership. So we do weed warrioring and other things um, in this um, Soviet Island and Linton Quarter area. Great, well, thank you so much for being here, both of you. Um, Rachel, can you set the stage with me on what movement ecology is and how it's used? Essentially, movement ecology is the branch of ecology that looks at why animals move throughout the landscape, how they move, and what sorts of habitats they need to, to move through. Um, so we're really looking at, on a species by species basis, what are the behavioral drivers of the ways that animals are using the landscape on a daily or a seasonal or an annual basis. That's a very um, succinct and professional um, <laughs> explanation of what that is. Um, I, you have a presentation too, do you wanna start sharing that? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Let me share my screen. Yeah. We can get started. So I think it'd be good to start today's discussion by looking at wildlife connectivity kind of broadly. So I'll talk a little bit about what wildlife connectivity is, why we care about it, how we figure out where wildlife most need connectivity. And then I know that Jane is going to talk a little bit later about a specific wildlife connectivity issue with northern red-legged frogs and how a group of this really dedicated volunteers are working to help. So to start off, what is connectivity? Um, connectivity is really the degree to which the landscape is facilitating or impeding movement. And there's many factors that influence how permeable a landscape is for wildlife or how easy it is for wildlife to move. So here in Oregon, our growth rate ranks in the top 10 in the nation and our population is expected to reach 4.6 million in the next four years. And this growth puts a lot of demand on the state's infrastructure, things like roads, electrical lines, freshwater housing, and that's leading to new residential and commercial developments, new houses, new apartment buildings, new shopping centers, new roadways, um, increased traffic volumes on existing roadways, new energy development. You know, we're seeing things like new solar and wind farms being put in and increased resource extraction. So things like logging and mining and agriculture. And all of those things affect the ability of wildlife to move across the landscape to meet their daily and their seasonal needs. And we're also dealing with the effects of a changing climate, um, which can lead to things like extended droughts, uh, more frequent and high intensity storms, more frequent and high intensity wildfires, uh, which also change the landscape and affect wildlife movement. And probably the single best example of the loss of connectivity for most people is gonna be roadkill. 
like who among us has not seen a deer or a skunk or a raccoon carcass alongside the road while driving? And these road killed wildlife were all trying to get from one place to another. They were all moving throughout their habitats. Their habitat was fragmented by a road and they were struck and killed by vehicles when trying to get from one part of their habitat to another. But the effects of connectivity loss extend beyond just that road killer, just that direct mortality. Um, that habitat loss and fragmentation can impact wildlife's access to suitable forage. So all the things they need to eat. Um, it can prevent access to breeding areas for successful reproduction, and it can have behavioral impacts that disrupt a species' ability to find food and shelter. So these issues are obviously a major concern. And the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, where I work, recognizes this as a priority for wildlife conservation in the state. Um, each state in the United States has what's called a state wildlife action plan. And these plans function as the overarching state strategies for conserving fish and wildlife and their habitats. And Oregon's state wildlife action plan is called the Oregon Conservation Strategy. And the Oregon Conservation Strategy outlines seven key conservation issues, which are landscape level threats to the state's species and their habitats. And one of those threats is barriers to animal movement, um, which essentially captures that loss of habitat connectivity. I have a quick question, actually, Rachel. Absolutely. Because I've, I've definitely heard and worked with the strategy before on different projects, different groups. I'm wondering who makes the strategy or what departments collaborate to make that? So ODFW writes the strategy, but we take input and collaboration from partner groups all across the state. So other state and federal agencies, nonprofit organizations, non-governmental organizations, Anyone who's actively working in the wildlife field, we ask to comment and contribute when we do a strategy revision. Cool. Excellent. So I think it's important to note that it's not just ODFW, it's a good segue, it's not just ODFW that's working to help keep wildlife connectivity um, active. So there's a number of organizations throughout the state that are all dedicated to improving wildlife connectivity. The list that you see here on the screen is certainly not the only group of organizations that's working on this, but it is one group called the Oregon Habitat Connectivity Consortium, which was founded in 2016 to help foster uh, information sharing and collaboration toward identifying and enhancing connectivity for wildlife. So while there are many instances throughout the state of local areas that have identified connectivity needs for individual species like the harborton shuttle effort that jane's going to be talking about a little bit later um, more broadly in oregon we really lack information on where wildlife connectivity is intact where it's functioning but threatened and where it's been cut off completely and needs to be restored so through the collaboration of the groups in that oregon habitat connectivity consortium on the previous slide we developed a plan for a massive statewide effort um, to identify priority wildlife habitat connectivity areas in Oregon, which is called the Oregon Connectivity Assessment and Mapping Project, or OCAMP for short. And I'll probably say OCAMP mostly throughout the rest of this, this little talk. So OCAMP is a multi-year collaborative project that's going to look to map priority wildlife quarters for 54 of Oregon's wildlife species, which were all selected to represent the needs of Oregon's diverse wildlife. ODFW is directing this effort, but we also have assistance from Portland State University and Samara Group. And the work involved in this project is it's pretty intensive, but I'll touch on a few key points in this process about how we are identifying where these priority connectivities are. This is a three year project and we hope to be complete in December of 2022. So this slide shows the pictures of all 54 species that we selected for this project. And I think it's important to note that connectivity is really species specific. The landscape looks very different to something like a northern red-legged frog than it does to a woodpecker that can fly. And both of the species perceive the landscape differently and move differently than something like a pronghorn or a deer. So what would be considered habitat for one species might be considered a barrier to another. So it's important when we're identifying these priority connectivity areas to take into account a broad diversity of species and all of their respective needs the habitats with which they're associated, the features on the landscape that could impede their movement, 
um, their movement and dispersal capabilities and how those features might change in the future, either through habitat loss or through shifts in habitat due to change in climate. So we selected these 54 species uh, in Oregon, 23 mammals, 16 birds, eight amphibians, four reptiles, and three invertebrates. And they all represent different habitat types and movement capabilities. These species were selected as surrogates, which means that they're representative of a broader suite of habitat associations or habitat needs. So for example, we selected the American beaver as a surrogate for species that require riparian habitats or move along or near rivers and streams. So in this project, we'll assess each of these species needs independently to ensure that when we're identifying our priority connectivity areas, we're representing the needs of all of Oregon's wildlife, even though they all kind of move and use habitat differently. So the first step in our assessment is to build what's called a habitat permeability map for each species, which is going to illustrate which parts of the landscape are easier or which parts of the landscape are more difficult for a species to move through. So this example here is for northern red-legged frog. And the blue colors in this map represent areas that are more permeable for the frog, things like forested areas and bodies of water, while the reds represent areas that are more of a barrier, things like roads and urban development. And this permeability map is going to form the basis for our connectivity model. Areas that are more permeable are easy for a species to move through, and less permeable areas are most likely to impede a species connectivity. So we use this permeability map to figure out where wildlife are most likely to move. Um, a good way to think about this is maybe think about taking a ball to the top of a hill and letting the ball roll down the hill. The ball is naturally going to move downhill along the path of least resistance. So areas of the hill that are smoother will mean that the ball will probably move more quickly and pick up speed, whereas areas that are bumpy or more rough might slow the ball down. And we can also expect there to be obstacles on the hill as well. So if a ball runs into a rock, it might end up rolling around one side or the other rock. If the ball encounters a small stick, maybe it'll just roll right over the stick. But if the stick is too large or maybe it runs into a, a tree, then the ball might stop completely. And in some ways, we can think of wildlife movement as being kind of similar to that of the ball on the hill. So wildlife also naturally kind of want to move across the landscape wherever it's easiest for them based on their habitat needs. But wildlife are encountering obstacles too. And some of the obstacles they can get around, um, like in the ball example, the, the ball could get around the rock, uh, but other obstacles might stop wildlife altogether. So when we take those things into consideration, how wildlife are likely to move along the path of least resistance, how there's obstacles that they might have to move around or might stop them, we can build another model of connectivity. And that model might look something like this. And this is a map showing how we expect a given species, in this case mule deer, to move across the landscape. The bright yellow colors in this example are areas where movement is most intense. So if we go back to our example with the ball, these would be areas on the hill that were smooth that allowed the ball to roll freely. The cooler, more blue areas on this map are areas where we'd expect less movement for this species. Maybe the habitat just isn't quite right for deer there, or maybe there's obstacles that the deer can't go through. Now this particular map can be a little bit difficult to interpret, so the next step for us is to refine this model and to pull out areas that are the most important for connectivity for each species. So that's what you see here with the map on the right. Those yellow areas are areas that we've identified as being priority wildlife corridors for the mule deer in this area. Rachel, quick question. When you yeah. are well, I guess uh, maybe you want to um, clarify, are you actually going out into the field and collecting data or do you take the data and you create the models like this? So we take the data that we have and we create models like this, but one important step for the future is going to be collecting additional data to make sure that the models we're building are accurately representing what's going on on the landscape. So we can oh, use things cool. like GPS tracking collars, for example, to figure out if the connectivity areas that we're identifying in our models are representing really well where animals are actually moving. Oh, gotcha. And how long, how, how many seasons or how long in time does it take to create this map? Or does it take the data to create this map? 
So uh, the data that we have, we try to get the most recent data that we have as possible, but we can use in terms of animal movement data, we can use maybe 20 years worth. Um, so we have a lot of data available on hand for different species that we can use when we make these maps. Gotcha. And then also use um, geospatial data, things like land cover type, um, sometimes soils for specific species. Um, we use data on where the roads are on the landscape and all of those kind of go into these models that we're building. Cool. Excellent. So we go through this whole process for each of the 54 species in our assessment. And again, these 54 species were selected as surrogates for specific habitat types or habitat associations with the intent to represent all of Oregon's wildlife. So if we combine each of these species connectivity maps, we start getting a better sense for connectivity for wildlife as a whole. So you can see here the mule deer in yellow in the background, we've added uh, another species priority corridors in blue, a third species in green and a fourth species in orange. And that map on the right shows all of their stacked corridors. And that allows us to start identifying patterns that can be used in prioritizing where conservation work is most needed. So for example, the area that you see circled on the left-hand side, that big oval, is a location where three different species, the orange, the blue, and the yellow, all overlap. And that might be a target area for working with partners to ensure that that connection is not lost, maybe through something like a conservation easement or removal of old fencing that might block wildlife movement. And then on the example on the right, there's three species, the yellow, the green, and the orange that all narrow and cross a road, and that's Highway 97. And that might be a location that we look at to uh, work with maybe the Oregon Department of Transportation for construction of a wildlife passage feature, um, an overcrossing or undercrossing at that site to help reduce wildlife vehicle collisions for the species that are trying to get, the high, trying to get across the highway there. Um, ultimately, the products from the Oregon Connectivity Assessment and Mapping Project will highlight statewide priorities for enhancing and protecting wildlife connectivity. Um, the map that we're intending to produce is supposed to be, is, you know, will hopefully be used by the public and our partners, um, both within, within and outside ODFW to help mitigate those demands of Oregon's growing population. Um, to inform land use development and permitting for new, renewable energy development, to guide granting efforts, to target areas that are in need of habitat restoration or protection to help facilitate wildlife movement, um, to help prevent those wildlife vehicle collisions, and to help inform planning processes and operations of other organizations and groups um, like the Harborton shuttle effort. So what you're saying is it's everything that you do is so we can do work on purpose like with yes. intent yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're not out there just like looking around for conservation work to do and think that it's in an area you know for sure you're doing the work for us mapping this out to let us know yes this is a corridor yes this is an area of need that kind of thing absolutely yeah i mean the state is is really so massive and there are so many wildlife species and conservation work is difficult because we're very limited in the funding that we have available or in the workforce that we can apply to it. So by building these maps and highlighting these priority areas, we know where to focus our attention to do the best possible work that we can. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you for that presentation. Um, that was actually nice to see everything all together in one too, because um, we talk a lot about different components of this, about the work that's needed in different areas and across different species. And sometimes it gets overwhelming too, to think about all the different needs, like you're talking about um, the different, like beaver, you know, mule deer, frogs, um, <laughs> can get a little overwhelming and everybody specializes in their own thing. So um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And also as we transition here with um, frogs into our next presenter, Jane, Jane Hartline, who doesn't really need an introduction. I feel like um, as a dedicated and accomplished conservation specialist, um, <laughs> the words out on the Harborton Frog Shuttle and speaking from the amount of inquiries that I get about this project and the hot press that your frog population and the shuttle project receive, it's definitely a fan fave. So um, Jane, I'd love for you to, in your own words, maybe explain the project, it take us through the journey of the Harborton red-legged frog population, the journey that they take every year. So we have a population of about 2,000 plus frogs 
uh, red-legged frogs specifically, which are on the state sensitive species list. Um, the frogs are actually forest frogs most of the year. They live up in Forest Park uh, above Highway 30 on the way between the little community of Linton and Sovi Island. And uh, once a year, they have to make a journey a migration down from the park across Highway 30 and they end up at a place called the Harborton Wetlands where they um, meet friends um, and lay eggs. <laughs> so um, Meet friends. <laughs> <laughs> that's a euphemism. Uh, <laughs> Love story, so, really. <laughs> right, right, right. So, and then of course they have to go back uphill uh, this is a picture of Harborton Drive. It's a nice, quiet little road uh, above Highway 30, where the frogs first come down a cliff onto the road. And then from here, they have to go on down another cliff, and they have to cross Highway 30 at rush hour. Uh, <laughs> so, um, if we're not out there, uh, they get squished. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's not a laughing matter, but it's, I mean, they're frogs, you know, Highway 30 is pretty busy too. Exactly. <laughs> and so we have a really dedicated group of volunteers that are out there on nights like tonight to make sure that that, um, that this doesn't happen. So um, the volunteers will be up on Harborton Road where it's Harborton Drive, where it's nice and quiet and we will intercept the frogs up there. We put a, a, um, a, a, a weed cloth actually along the railing there so that it slows the frogs down long enough that we can stick them in buckets. And uh, then we drive them uh, down to the wetlands so that they don't have to cross the road. So How long is that drive? <laughs> What's that? How long is that drive? It's like a two, like a one minute oh, drive or? Yeah, it's really, yeah, like a one minute it's drive. Like Okay. Uh, we have to go out to the highway and down to the next intersection and then drive back to where we let the frogs out. Mm. Uh, and it's a really nice wetland. Um, one thing I like to mention is, and you, you saw, saw the slide earlier, that whole area used to be, all along Highway 30, used to be wetlands. And uh, the frogs moved freely from the forest that's still, the forest is still there, but the wetlands are not. And the Harbison wetland is really the only wetland that's left that um, still works for frogs to come down and breed. So it's super important. And uh, I had once had someone from the um, city of Portland, a biologist from the city of Portland said, we have looked all over the city for red-legged frogs and here they all are. <laughs> So, so anyway, um, it's, uh, it's, it's really exciting to be out there. Um, some nights are really quiet. You think there's going to be frogs and there aren't. Um, and other nights you think there's not going to be frogs and you're overwhelmed. So the way yeah. we work is we have a team for each night of the week that is on call. And I'm the Monday night captain. And, <laughs> and so so, tonight you're going to, or Oh yeah, oh yeah, tonight is a perfect frog night. And uh, what's interesting about tonight is it's actually, it ha I, I lay back up and say it has to be at least 45 degrees and it has to be wet. So preferably it's like pouring rain, but um, if it's been raining and the, the road is still wet, they'll still move. So, you know, as long as it showers during the night. Um, if <laughs> If the stars come out, we have a rule. If the stars come out, the frogs don't. So um, tonight- Is that lore or is that just, well, because oh, no. there's no rain? It's experience, it's experience. <laughs> you look up and you see the stars and you think, yep, the frogs have stopped moving tonight and we can go home. Um, tonight it's actually gonna warm up and keep raining all night long. Wow. And so uh, I have my crew organized into three different shifts starting at um, five. And so we're going to be out there till at least midnight. Wow. Um, <laughs> getting those frogs across. And, and, you know, who knows? Because some nights we think, okay, this is a perfect night for frogs. But for whatever reason, the temperature drops, you know, to like tonight it's supposed to start out about 47. But if it drops to 
45, the frogs may just go, you know what, it isn't a good night for this. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't, they don't give you a heads up, yeah. Right. And then in that case, we'll all be just standing around with our buckets, yep. uh, talking about what movies we've seen lately. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, it's it's a it's it's fun even if the frogs don't come out. But when they do, it's just crazy and and really um, exciting. And we had I think the biggest night we've ever had was 682 frogs moved in one night. Wow! So was that last this last season that, that yeah, happened? Yes, wow. it was. And I was out there, and um, it was very challenging, but we got them all across. <laughs> So how many, sorry, how many volunteers did you have for that night then? Um, I think that we probably had about um, eight or nine through the course of the evening. What we try to do is put do some shifts so that nobody has to be out in the rain for 10 hours straight. So. <laughs> that's kind yeah, of yeah. Hours, uh, That's about enough. I, yeah. But, well, it sounds like between the data that you're basically, I mean, you're collecting data every single time that you're mapping this out, you're taking numbers, you have the interactions of the volunteers with the frogs, um, and then the mapping that Rachel's done, where it obviously shows, you know, the northern part of the state, where there's that heavy area that's been mapped for the northern red-legged frogs in their corridors, and then it kind of trickles as you go south. I feel like between the two data sets, it should be pretty obvious that there's a need here. And of course, Jane, you know, you're hearing conversationally oh well here are all of literally they're all right here you know like they're just going up and down this row they're just trying to get to their wetlands they're doing what feels natural to them so yeah it sounds like there's a pretty distinguished point there that there should be some kind of work done and something i'm not one to tell you what the work is but <laughs> i mean ponds maybe some kind of tunnel of right. some kind <laughs> we're open to ideas <laughs> Um, all right, well, um, I know a lot of people want to know what it takes to become a volunteer for the Frog Shuttle. Do you want to go over that now? I Yes, I would. I, I've actually had quite a few inquiries lately, and our teams at this point are mostly full for this year. Um, we can't have too many people out there at once, or we'll scare the frogs back up the hill. Um, so we have about 14 people on each a team for each night of the week. That's not to say that if people are interested, they shouldn't go ahead and contact me because I can get them on a list for um, to be notified when we do our training at the beginning of next season, which will be probably um, in early December. So at the beginning of next year, I could probably get people on on teams um, for this year. What what we might still need is people who are willing to take those really late shifts. Uh, I just got a couple of volunteers in that um, we, on our forum, we ask you if you're a night owl, you know, whether there's a specific time that you need to get home because you got to go to work the next day or right. whether you're kind of going to be up at midnight anyway, so you might as well be out with the frogs. Uh, and so sometimes we can um, have a use for people who are willing to take those late shifts. But other than that, the early shifts are pretty much filled for this year. Um, you never know, somebody might drop out. So anyway, um, you can, could just uh, email me and you see the, the email address on the screen there and I can send you our volunteer instructions and you can look at that and see if it's a commitment you're willing to make. What we actually ask you to do is to block out the, the night of the week, a night of the week, whichever team you're going to be on. We ask you which nights work for you, but you'll be on a team for just one night and we ask you to block that night out for the entire season. And it's not that you'll be out the whole time. I mean, I think my team's probably been out maybe six or eight nights out of the four months each year, uh, but we have to be at the ready. And if it's gonna be, you know, 19 and snowing, you know, you just know that it's okay to do something else with your evening. You don't have to keep it blocked off. And a night like tonight, um, it's all hands on deck. And other nights, it's borderline, and they might move and they might not. And so, you know, I might go out there and just see what's going on and tell everybody to have their rain pants on and have their water bottles handy just in case. Yeah, it's, not, it's definitely a commitment. And it's dark and it's, yeah. you know, and it's winter time. Is there a cutoff age for people? I know a lot of people oh. want to bring their kids. 
Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, what we found, we, we did try a few younger kids, and what we found is that as they're really good at helping intercept frogs. They're yeah. really fast and nimble, but um, their attention span when it's cold and wet does not last very long, and they're ready to go home. Uh, and then with older kids, we found, like teens, we found transportation and school activities has been a problem. So yeah. basically, our um, cutoff has been, um, again, I think it was 16, but between 16 and 18, you have to, your parent has to come with you. Gotcha. So you have to volunteer as a team. Um, so that's that's how that works and if you're 18 and you have your own transportation then you're cool well i'll put that information again uh here in the chat window for people um, i also have a few more questions for both of you that were submitted this last week from facebook and email and i'll try to get to the ones that maybe haven't been answered yet uh, between your two segments and if we don't get through all of them then maybe we can do like a little follow-up q a with you guys um first up I have, I, I think, I think a lot of animals travel through my backyard throughout the migration season. What can I do for their safety? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so we find that fencing in developed areas is usually one of the biggest deterrents for movement for animals. Um, and fencing is kind of a hard thing to change for some folks, especially if you have a pet that you need to keep contained. Um, but if you do have the ability to uh, retrofit your fencing to make it more wildlife friendly so that larger animals can jump over it or smaller animals can get under it and get through your yard in and out, uh, that, that can be super helpful. Um, and there's guides online if you search wildlife friendly fencing for the, the best ways to, to retrofit your existing fencing to help wildlife get through your yard. Uh, another thing is making the habitat in your yard wildlife friendly. So making sure you have native plants, uh, maybe that you have a water source like a, a pond or a fountain, uh, even a, a, a bird feeder slash a, a bird bath can be helpful. Uh, making sure you have things like rocks and logs um, that smaller animals can use for cover to feel secure as they move through your yard. All those things can help uh, make the habitat in your yard more friendly for wildlife. Very helpful. I think that's a great answer. Um, and you know, back backyard ponds, we've seen red-legged frogs breed in pretty small ponds. So um, you know, if you are inclined to put in a pond, uh, and you if you've seen frogs in your you know in your neighborhood, um, you know, give them a place to be, give them a place to breed. Give them a little home. Also, the other thing that I would mention there is if you have cats as pets, keeping them indoors uh, because cats can be very destructive to local wildlife, especially the small animals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, those small mammals. Um, so keeping your cats secure indoors can also help. Gotcha. Okay, moving on here. How long does it take for animals to start using things like underpasses or overpasses? So we found that this is species dependent. Um, some species start using them right away. They find them really quickly. Um, those are species that tend to be more tolerant of disturbance like coyotes, for example, or raccoons. Um, other species take longer. Um, the wildlife crossing structures that we implemented in the uh, Sun River area, the lava butte crossing structures, those go under Highway 97. And that's been more than 10 years now. And we found that it took two or three years for most of the wildlife in the area to find and start making regular use of that crossing structure. So it can take some time. I would say with, with frogs, uh, part of it is, is fencing to funnel them towards the crossing. And um, so, so like at Harborton, we know where they come down. And if we had a crossing, we would likely just put up a temporary fence during that season so they would come to the fence and then they would uh, naturally just want to go downhill, particularly if there's a little water flowing that way, and they would just go down the hill and then there would be the, the crossing. So um, that, that we have techniques to help them discover it. Gotcha. Um, is it dangerous for frogs? Is it dangerous for the frogs for humans to be touching and holding them? 
I would say that based on the way the numbers have in, increased, it's definitely better for them than crossing Highway 30. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, it's, not, it's not ideal for them. We have oils on our fingers that can uh, get on their skin and kind of disrupt the ability of their skin to absorb moisture and things like that. But it's way better to have limited contact and get them across the road than to not touch them and have them get railed by cars. And we do tell our volunteers to, you know, wash your hands before you come. Don't be slathering on hand cream or hand sanitizer or any of those kinds of things. Just come with clean hands so, so that you won't be, you know, smearing substances on the frogs. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, um, I have a question here about trackers. How do you even put a tracker on a frog or an amphibian? <laughs> Yeah, so we, there are very small trackers that we can use now for amphibians, and it's essentially a little elastic belt um, with some plastic tubing so it doesn't chafe or rub, and it goes right above their hips on their back legs. Um, it's a little bitty device with a little bitty antenna, and it just kind of sits on their back right above their hips, and they wear the little belt until we've gotten the information we need, and then we can go and find them and capture them again and slip the belt off, and they go about their lives. All right, well, I think we have time for one more. Um... Let's see, what species has the largest corridor? I don't know if you know that. <laughs> That's a good question. So I would say that the species that have the largest corridors are probably those that move more. So they have the largest ranges and those are our larger bodied, uh, more mobile species like cougar and deer that are moving, you know, sometimes upwards of a hundred kilometers in a season between, a, like for deer, between a, a summer and a winter range, uh, 100 to 200 kilometers for those deer. Um, cougar can be super wide ranging, especially when they're young. They disperse into new habitats and they can go the distance of several states sometimes. Um, birds are also individuals that need bigger corridors because we think about long distance migratory birds, some of which are migrating from mm -hmm. to the Antarctic over the course of a year. And those, those birds need large swaths of, of um, stopover habitat that maybe covers several states. Um, so it, it really is, it's again, species specific and the, the animals that are the larger bodied and that are moving longer distances tend to need bigger corridors, but um, smaller animals, we can't forget about them either. They need, they need corridors too. So true. <laughs> Makes sense. All right. Well, that's all, all we have time for. Um, but for anybody who has questions they submitted online or for who asked questions that we weren't able to get to, we'll release uh, further questions like a QA response maybe on our website, myowf.org. Jane, would you like to plug any other projects or events coming up for the Frog Shuttle maybe? <laughs> um, I, I can't think of any. No, okay. I, we're, uh, we're just chugging away for this year. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and I'll put your... Um, your contact here, yep, up on the screen. And Rachel, is there anything that you'd like to give a final shout out for, maybe how people can see what you're up to, or do you have anywhere online that you can direct folks to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, www.oregonconservationstrategy.org is that website for the Oregon Conservation Strategy. And that has links there for all of our key conservation issues, and also um, a web page on that site for the Oregon Connectivity Assessment and Mapping Project. Um, so we can drop a link in the chat bar to that page. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for your time and knowledge, of course, on this topic um, and your continued efforts for the wildlife um, that we have here in our state. Thanks for everybody else who was able to join our discussion today. So you may have noticed we'll be releasing community conservation episodes monthly with wide ranging topics. So to be sure that the series and public education on conservation um, continues with our foundation, please donate to the Oregon Wildlife Foundation today by using the form below, or you can visit our website, myowf.org. This discussion will be released on our website and the link will be sent to your registered email. So please share, and you can always subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date with OWF projects. And I'll put that link uh, for our email list in the chat now. And one last thing I want to mention is the Safe Passage campaign that we have in the form of a new proposed license plate. I hope that you're all familiar with it now, if you can see it there. Um, it's called the Watch for Wildlife License Plate. Uh, plate sales uh, for the specialty plate will come back to our foundation, not any other state department, and will specifically go to funding habitat connectivity projects, which the Harborton Frog Shuttle is actually a great example of, but you can learn more on our website at myowf.org. Thanks again, and we'll catch you next time.